Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, February 10th. We're in the middle of an anniversary week celebrating all kinds of spiritual birthdays and starts of works that the Lord is doing. It is an exciting week, so if you are within our realm and want to join our family, if you don't know how to plug in, send me a text or get me a message and we'll get you plugged in. But uh, we just want you to know that it's been wonderful. We've celebrated uh, Pastor Gill's 50th spiritual birthday, my dad were here to be with us, tomorrow would have been his 70th, and there's uh, more going on, ministry that's been started this week, so it's been a great week. But in our Wednesday afternoon Bible class <clears throat> on February 10th, I think I said that, <laughs> we are in the middle of the millennium. Don't you wish it were true? Yes. <laughs> the millennium is true, but I mean us being in the middle of it, but it is coming it's coming in God's perfect timing, His timing and His way. And we've been talking a bit about the millennium, so I'm not going to backtrack because really as we hit several points, they overlap and remind us of others. But let me give you just a little overview of the millennium as we come down into where we are in class today. Because last week I spoke to the fact that there are other views that do not believe there's any millennium coming at all. Or another that believes is that the, after the thousand years of reign on the earth, which doesn't, to me, make any sense at all. But let me tell you, um, the other views that are given usually also teach replacement theology, which is that God is finished with the Jewish people, that when they rejected Messiah as a whole, God rejected them as a whole and moved over to the church, gave all his promises to the church. They don't carry anything else across. They don't carry the warnings that God gave to the children of Israel. They don't carry the curses that God said, if you don't do, that they would endure. They just simply take the good part and leave the rest behind. That would be an unfaithful God. That would be a God who doesn't keep his word. We know nothing could be farther from the truth, that God is faithful, does keep his word, will keep the nation of Israel. It will survive even the coming tribulation, and it will be set up as head nation. We've been talking about that in our millennium. What's important to see in these characteristics is that the coming of the Messiah is what makes it possible. Without his coming, it would not be possible. Uh, Isaiah 11, 1, Roger, can you help her just get a little towel for her? In Isaiah 11, 1, we have a shoot will spring from the stem of, yes, of Yesi, Yeshai in our Hebrew, or a branch that's shooting up and growing from its roots. We know the branch is a name for Messiah. We get that from Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. We'll look at them later, so I won't read them now, but, but just remember it's going to talk about the branch that springs forth and fills the face of the earth. This branch that bears uh, from the root the stem of Jesse would be referring to the humanity of Yeshua Jesus, that Jesse was uh, the father of David, and we know David, Melch David, King David, is in the genealogical line to our Messiah. We know that, that he's, the name is connected with Messiah many times in Scripture. How do we know this is the Lord? Verses 2 on. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. That spirit, the spirit of the Lord in, in our Lord, because the Ruch HaKodesh, Yehovah, and the, the Son, are all three are one. It's the spirit of the Lord that's of wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength. The spirit of knowledge, the fear of the Lord. That would be the, the reverential respect even that the Yeshua and his humanity had to his Father, Yehovah, in heaven. And he will not, I mean, he will delight in the fear of the Lord, not judge by what, his eyes see nor make decisions by what his ears hear but with righteousness will judge the poor decide with fairness for the humble of the earth strike the earth with the rod of his mouth here's where we know this is the time of uh, millennium because we know he rules with that rod of iron we looked at that last week uh, also righteousness is the belt around his hips and faithfulness the belt around his waist we know these are not characteristics of our world today. Everything isn't righteous and judgment, and we don't have the Lord sitting on an earthly throne where he is meeting out justice fairly, not by what somebody says or what somebody does that, that they hide the truth, but we know this is what will be coming. And further proof of it is that the wolf will dwell with the lamb. And as my mom used to say, they'll lie down together, but the lamb will not be in the wolf's stomach. 
and uh, the leopard will lie down with the goat. It goes on, the little boy will lead these, these animals that normally would be uh, consuming him also. Uh, and in verse 9 is critical, they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Mountain in scripture referred to symbolically is talking about a government. So nothing's going to hurt or destroy the government of our Lord. The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Do the waters cover the sea? Is the sea wet? <laughs> well, I think we'll all agree the sea is very wet. You stick a foot in the, the sea, you need to dry that foot off before you put your shoe back on, don't you? If the waters covering the sea are, are symbolic, what it's saying is, as we have water all over the world, and as we know that this is, is fact, so will be the fact that people will know the Lord. Can you imagine? This world, how many people know the Lord today? We're a drop in the bucket. But in that day, it will be the opposite. Everyone will know of the Lord, will know Him. He will rule and reign. What a beautiful time it will be of shalom on this earth during that time. And by Messiah coming, ruling as king, not coming lowly servant, not coming to suffer and die as he did the first time, but coming to rule and to reign as king. This is what we will have. This will be a glorious time. You can read more there later. Let's go to Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 9 and see. Remember, we like to look at, at Scripture together and get our full picture. Chapter 14, Zechariah. Zechariah 14 and verse 9. We're going to do a lot. I should have told you, get your fingers warmed up. We're going to go a lot through the prophets today. If you can't keep up, write the reference down and get it later because I want to get as much of this concise teaching together as possible. Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 9 says, The Lord will be king over all the earth. And I say, Hallelujah! On that day, the Lord will be the only one, and his name the only one. He is king above all kings, Lord above all lords. He is the ruling authority. It is his word, and oh, how the world will be blessed. Revelation 19 told us he was coming back to rule and to reign, that the armies of heaven were coming with him, and they will rule and reign with him. If you want to read that later, again, it's verses 11 through 16, in particular of Revelation 19 that I'm referring to. When he comes back to bring this kind of rule on the face of this earth, we are going to see from Isaiah chapter 59 that he is going to, to, all the nations are going to come under his feet. That he, the conquest will be won. Let me put it that way. Isaiah 59, we want to look at verses 20 and 21. And 20 and 21 say, A redeemer will come to Zion. Zion, named for Jerusalem. It's actually a mountain in Jerusalem, but a name for Jerusalem. To those in Yaakov, in Jacob, who turn from wrongdoing. To the Israel who is saved. To the Israel who is believing, the Redeemer will come to, to Zion, to Zion. And verse 21, as for me, God speaking, or the Lord speaking, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord, my spirit who is upon you, my words which I put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring. That's three generations already. And then says the Lord, from now and forever. Every generation, offspring that we've seen, because remember the people who go into the millennium, we don't read about them having a resurrected body where they've been changed as we will have been. So they're going to continue on much like uh, Adam and Eve would have in the garden had they never sinned. They would have kept procreating and they would have gone on living. So you're going to have offspring. You're going to have generation after generation. They can live out the thousand years. You can see how many generations would be in that time, but yet it even exceeds the millennial time that forever this is going to be true, that God's covenant will be with them, with those who are believers. He's talking specifically to the believing remnant of Israel here, that his spirit would be on them, 
and their, his words would be in their mouth. I can't hardly wait to see an Israel that is like that. And in that, Israel will be exalted up to that head nation position and be representing to the world this Messiah, this leader. Chapter 60, right next door to where we are in Isaiah. Okay, come on. My tablet doesn't want to cooperate. There we go. Verse 1 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. What's that light? The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Behold, darkness will cover the earth, deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, kings to the brightness of your rising. Raise your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons will come from afar. Your daughters will be carried on the hip. Then you will see and be radiant, and your heart will thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. That's the, the Gentile nations. The wealth of the nations will come to you. It goes on and on. This is glorious. This is what's coming to Israel. They've been at the people that sat in darkness, but the people who sat in darkness saw a great light. That light was Messiah coming in his first coming. He is the glory of the Lord, as it says up at the beginning in verse 1. That's the light. It has shined, but that light is coming back in all glory to rule and to reign forever and to, to work through Israel to be his nation representing him to a world that needs to see and hear and know this light and be led to it also. Verse 18 says, Violence will never, will not be heard again in your land, nor devastation or destruction within your borders, but you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. Can you imagine an Israel with no violence, with no destruction, with no devastation? An Israel that's, that's representative of the salvation of the Lord, that's bringing praise to him. Wow, I can hardly wait. Those of you who have been to Israel like I have, we see the beauty in Israel. We feel his spirit in Israel. But we see the negative around. We see those who are not in tune with their God. We see an Israel who is dealing with violence, that, that they have to worry about rocket attacks and worry about standing at a bus to stop and get knifed by one that they thought was a neighbor and friend but was really the enemy. It's nothing like this. I cannot imagine what it would, will be like. Uh, I just can't wait to see it. And we'll have front row seats because we're going to be there with him rolling and raining and helping him bring that, that shalom and that justice to the land. Salvation of Israel comes immediately before the millennium starts. We looked at that. This is just an overview for you. But remember uh, Zechariah 12.10, that they will see the one whom they've pierced. They will cry out, Baruch haba Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That those who have that saving faith, that turn and look to their Redeemer, accept him as their Messiah. They are the ones who will go into this kingdom. They are the ones who will see this blessing that we're talking about. Daniel, Daniel 12 tells us, well, let's go to Daniel because I don't think we did last week. So let's go to Daniel. Remember, again, I'm trying to give you proof from a number of sources. So you see, it's not just one thought or one idea, but when God's given the same message over a period of years, that they didn't know each other. They didn't compare notes. They didn't cheat and, and copy off of each other. It's the same message going again and again and again. I think we get it. I think we can be assured of it. Daniel tells us, at that time, Michael, Michael, the angel that's in relation to Israel, working in relation for Israel, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people. That's what I just said. Scripture said it more eloquently. Michael will arise. There'll be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. Obviously, in this verse, it's talking about Michael fighting for Israel during the tribulation period because we know the evil intent of Satan and his angels to come against the woman, to come against her child, to come against the offspring. We know the child is the Messiah. So it is Satan coming against Israel, coming against the Messiah, his plan for Israel, coming against the Jewish people, wanting to wipe them off the face of the earth. But God is assuring them at this time, when there's never been anything as as Horrible as this. At this time, 
everyone whose name is found written in the book, that's the book of life, they will be rescued. Israel will come through as a nation, but individually, the people who are believing are the ones who will come through and be rescued. Some will not make it through physically to the end. Verse 2 deals with that. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. They've died. They're going to be resurrected, some to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Remember, we see judgment. Who goes into the millennium out of the living people at the time of the Lord's return? This is referring to the, the people who are not alive, that they, there will be a resurrection time for them. We have talked about that. The resurrection called the first resurrection that's in three phases. That is for believers. And the second resurrection, which is not, to, uh, or the second death, I'm sorry, the second death, in, we'll come to it in Revelation 20 again, uh, but where they stand before God at the great white throne judgment for their judgment for going into everlasting suffering based on their actions when they were alive. The two are totally separate. They're not at the same time. And that's what it's saying here is some are raised. They'll go into their reward. Others are raised to go into eternal suffering. Um, and the ones that are with the Lord, it says that they'll shine like the stars in the heaven because they've led many to righteousness. It's like, like each star is, is a soul saved. Nice picture to think. Anyway, Daniel's referring to that. Let's look real quickly at Micah, Micha, because that's again another book we haven't looked at in light of uh, what we're teaching right now. Micah chapter 7. And if I type right, I I'll get it. Why do they say pay for, pray for the peace of Jerusalem when they know it's not going to happen until Christ comes? Because people like me who pray for the peace, and the question was asked, why do we pray for the peace of Jerusalem when it will not come until Messiah comes? Because we know total shalom, total peace will not come. But my prayer is for as much peace as possible for them. Just because, you know, our heart is with them. We care for them, and so we're praying for as much of God's mercy and grace that can be meted out and poured out in the midst of a world that is getting itself so ready for God's total judgment. Peace, just a little bit of peace. You're yeah, praying for. yeah. And in essence, when I'm praying for that total peace, I'm praying even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, because Amen. I know Amen. that that's when the peace will come. So when Amen. I'm praying for the peace, I'm in line with His plan and His purpose for Israel, which is to be that peace. Okay. So. Okay? Okay, that makes sense. Good question. Good question. Mm -hmm. Micah, Micha, chapter 7, verse 18. Who is God like you who pardons wrongdoing, passes over a rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. That's beautiful to remember that this judgment and this wrath is for a time. But God is, he's remembering his people. And he's not looking for his people to be perfect, but he's looking for those people who've come to him for forgiveness. He's going to have mercy on them. He takes pity in them. He'll trample over their wrongdoings. He'll cast their sins into the depths of the sea, verse 19. And then he says, it says, you, meaning God, will give truth to Jacob and favor to Avraham, that's Yaakov and Avraham, which you swore to our forefathers from the days of old. God promised it. He promised it to Avraham. He promised it to Jacob. He promised it to Israel. And we pray for it because we want the faithfulness of God to come and to be seen by a world that is calling it a lie. And knock that lie out. God's plan unthwarted. And let that encourage you. I don't care what comes against you. I don't care how bad your circumstances. I don't care how upside down you feel and how confused you are. God has a plan. And he will bring you through it. If you lose your physical being in this world because of your circumstances, God says don't fear what man can do to you. Fear sure. the one who, who deals with your soul. That's where the fear should come in. Only God can touch the soul. Satan can afflict the, the physical. Satan can bring death on the physical when God permits in his perfect will, which is hard for us to understand, but he allows for his purposes. But that soul inside of that one that knew the Lord, that soul is not stopped 
from being with the Lord. That soul safely is escorted into the presence of the Lord where it will be forever. Satan does not win. He's going to dance on, well, I can't say dance on the graves of the two witnesses because he doesn't even let them be buried. But he thinks he stopped the two messengers of God, Revelation chapter um, 11. <laughs> he thinks that, that he has won the victory. And three and a half days later, those bodies resurrect right in front of the eyes of the world. And then they proceed to go into heaven. I mean, what... What more do you need to see people to realize there is a God and He is the one with the last word? No matter what you are seeing, let it encourage you, let it strengthen you wherever you are. In this time to have this kind of peace, we talked about it last week, the Satan would be bound for the thousand years. That was Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. We looked at that ahead so uh, in detail, uh, so we won't go over it now. We're going to come back and see what happens to him after the millennium, once we get through talking about the millennium. We also talked, I believe, prior of how the believers have been rewarded and come back to rule and reign with Messiah. The, the rewards that we see are Revelation 20. In fact, if you want to know about the millennium, read Revelation 20. The chapter is all about um, the millennium in great detail. We use these other prophets to support what's being said, but Revelation 20 gives us that great view. And in chapter um, verse 4 of chapter 20, we see, I saw thrones, they that sat on them, and judgment was given to them. If you're sitting on a throne and you're meeting, meeting out judgment, you are in a good position. It goes on, John said, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Yeshua, because of the word of God. Those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received the mark on their foreheads and on their hands. They came to life, they were resurrected, and they <clears throat> reigned with Messiah for a thousand years. That's what we're talking about here. And we see, we know beheading is during the tribulation especially. We know that the taking of the mark of the image, that's tribulation. So we know this is talking about a group of people who came through the tribulation, maybe not through physically because they lost their lives, they were beheaded, but they came through spiritually, their soul came through, and they're brought back, resurrected to rule and to reign with Messiah. God wins. You win when you're on God's side, on, you know, on God's team. And again, because I had just referred to it, the rest of the dead, the ones who were not believers, uh, did not, verse 5, did not come to life till the thousand years were completed. They're going to remain where they are in the, the, the uh, suffering side of Sheol till the thousand years are completed. And then it says this is the first resurrection. So the last part of that first resurrection, I believe, is the tribulation saints that are resurrected to rule and to reign with Messiah that we're reading about here. Verse 6 tells us, Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But these that are resurrected, they'll be priests of God and of Messiah and will reign with him for a thousand years. They're going to be the priests are representatives of God throughout the millennial time. So Satan stopped their life during the tribulation. They were beheaded, but they will rule and they will reign during the thousand years. God has the final word, and I love it. Um, when it talks about the first resurrection and the second death, remember if you are born twice, you die once. That's born physically born again spiritually, John 3. Then you physically you die once, but spiritually you live on forever. If you only have that physical birth, you die twice. You will die physically and you will die spiritually. You won't be resurrected to everlasting life of, of reigning with the Lord and enjoying. You're only resurrected to go into the lake of fire forever and ever. So quite a separation there. We looked last week extensively at who goes into the kingdom, the sheep and the goats. We saw the sheep are the ones on the right. They go in. They are the ones who believe. The goats are the ones who were not believers. They will not get to go into the, the millennium even though they made it through the tribulation. They will be cast out and held out of the kingdom waiting the time of final judgment. We saw... Um, 
we saw the judgment on Gentiles and on Jewish people, the judgment the same. They have to be believing in Messiah to be on the victory side. We looked at that in Matthew 23, Matthew 25, at the different judgments. We saw the talents showing those that they showed their faithfulness by their actions. We saw those when the Lord said that, that, that they had done it unto him, they would given him water, food, clothing, shelter, visited him in prison. He, and they said, when did we do it to you, Lord? And he said, when you did it to my brethren, you did it to me. So those who helped the Jewish people during the tribulation, those who helped the Jewish believers during the tribulation, both groups who will be hunted down by uh, satanic means via the Antichrist, those are the ones that, that he was saying they are being blessed. Who's going to show faithfulness to them? Only those who are believers in, in the Lord, who are doing it for the Lord, because they're putting their own lives at risk, and many of them will lose their lives for doing it. So the only ones who would do it would be the ones who truly have faith in the Lord and know this is what is right. And he rewards them with entrance into the, the kingdom or into eternal reign with him. Okay, I think we looked a little bit at the construction of Hezekiel's temple. This is done by the Messiah. Again, I won't go into much detail here. Um, let, me, let me lay down the, the foundation. I won't go into the detail of the temple. The details are seen in chapters 40 through 48 in Ezekiel. Before we go to Ezekiel, let me go to Isaiah chapter 2. Um, the reason why I'm saying this is some people read and get very confused about Hezekiel's temple. It's not the temple during the tribulation. It's the temple that Messiah sets up. It's huge. When we do have time, and we will, we'll go into the size of it and we'll see the difference of it from what was uh, in, uh, well, the, the two temples prior. And know that the temple that will be rebuilt during the tribulation, and there will be a temple rebuilt, it could even start before the tribulation, but it will be in action during the tribulation, that that is not the temple that the glory of the Lord will fill that we read about in Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 4. In Isaiah chapter 2, um, I want to read for us just quickly verses 1 to 5. The word which Yeshia, the son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Yerushalayim. Now it will come, back, come about, i got to slow down. Now it will come about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established. Remember, is that a mountain is like his government. Is the government being established, the house of the Lord being established on the mountains of Jerusalem? It will be established as the chief of the mountains. It's going to be the head. It will be raised above the hills. All the nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Yaakov, Jacob, so that he may teach us about his ways, so we may walk in his paths. For the law will go out from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations. He will mediate for peoples. They will beat their swords instead of using them to kill people into plowshares. Their spears, instead of spearing people, pruning knives that they'll use in gardening. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. Come, house of Yaakov, let's walk in the light of the Lord. Can you imagine? Wow, how beautiful it's going to be. It's hard to comprehend. It all is that. hard to comprehend, but it makes it very clear that the Lord is going to be on this earth. He's going to be ruling from Mount Zion. He's going to be ruling from Jerusalem. He's going to be judging the nation so that there is fairness and righteous rule that goes out. There's not going to be war during this time, and they can all go up to the house of the Lord to worship Him, to see Him, to glean blessing from Him. This, uh, wow, wow. I mean, like David said, oh, just to be in the house of the Lord. You know, he could hardly wait to go up, to enter into his course with thanksgiving and into his, his uh, what with praise, gates and courts. Anyway, it's a picture symbolically of going into the temple, but the temple is a picture of this coming that will sit on earth, that the peoples of the earth will be able to go into. Right now there's a heavenly, and wow, when we'll get into that, that new Jerusalem also. 
But here is what is coming when the Lord rules from Mount Zion. Now let me take you into Ezekiel. And I'm only going to go into chapter 44, right in the middle of the chapters I told you to look at. And we're going to look at verse 4. 44, 4. That's easy to remember. Is that in book four? Ezekiel. 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 This is where we're looking at the temple during the millennium. Yes. This huge temple where they're all coming up to worship the Lord. And then their nations are blessed. In verse 4, it says, Then he brought me by the way of the north gate to the front of the house. Okay, the front of the temple. I looked. This is Ezekiel in a vision. I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord. That's the Shekhinah glory of God. The glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. How did he respond? He fell on his face. He fell down in worship, in awe, and in adoration at the glory that filled the temple. This, remember, when, when, the, um, when we have the temple um, in, in uh, okay, how am I, I'm trying to do this concisely. We have the temple back in, in Old Testament times. Let me just put it to you that way, okay? And we see in Ezekiel, we see that the, well, actually go all the way back to the tabernacle. And the Shekinah glory was a glory cloud that filled the Holy of Holies. It was something that the people could see the cloud lifted up above the Holy of Holies. And when the high priest would go in once a year to put blood on the mercy seat, it was filled with um, smoke because even the glory was so bright that if the incense smoke hadn't been there, the high priest would be blinded. It was a glorious place to be, though. When the high priest would come back out from being there, he would come back, he'd go in in white linen that he'd strip down to to do the sacrifices, probably bloodstained. He'd go in there, and the people would wait, and they would wait. I'm sure it was a pregnant pause. They were hoping God was going to accept that sacrifice that would atone their sins for another, another year. They'd know their sins had been covered. And when they would see that high priest come back out and represent himself to the people again, he'd come back out fully clothed in all that the high priest would wear, the glory uh, robes, the, the ephod that had the name of God on his, on his forehead and, and all. And I'm sure it was a huge hurrah, a huge rejoicing hallelujah that went up that the sacrifice had been accepted, that their sins had been atoned for again for another year. And here is, is what I'm trying to, to take you to. Now they're coming into the presence of the Lord, of this one who that priest represented in his glory was nothing like the glory of our Lord. Now let me take you to the two. Let me take you to one who was stripped and in that humility, bore our sins on the cross, died in that humility, blood stained. That was the last they saw of him. Uh, and I'm talking Yeshua Jesus in his, his human form. That's the last they saw of him. Three days have passed. Three nights have passed. I am so thankful I was not alive then. Can you imagine the horror, the dread, what filled their hearts, the depression, the, the confusion because they didn't have the whole everything like we do to study it and understand it and they're trying to they're trying to understand and their mind's just been blown but all they've seen is like that high priest that went in with blood stripped down nothing glorious blood now let me take you to that garden too let me take you to that morning when the stone's been rolled back and angelic hosts are filling it, and there is glory that's coming out of it. And the joy and the escalation of their hearts must have just soared when they go and they find this tomb is empty. And the next time they saw the Lord, when he appeared to them to Miriam, it was right there in the garden before he had even gone to his Father in heaven. He stops and he lovingly talks to her. And then when we see he appears to the others through the closed doors and suddenly is in their midst, he's not come in bloodied and in the humil humility of the garb, but he is still somewhat contained, but his glory was there because of who he was. And he's in, in that resurrected body that could come right through the walls. And the next time when we all will see him, we will see that Shekhinah glory, that glory that is so bright that when he comes, they're going to see him from the east to the west. It can't be hidden. That glory that filled 
th their room when they saw him in that resurrection power that caused them to rejoice. Can you imagine? They thought he was dead and they see he's alive. Oh, from from the pit to ecstasy. And they're so enthralled with that and they're, they're even filled by that power. But here now, we come further down the line, we come into this temple and we're told that the glory, and that's where I started that in Ezekiel before this time, we had that when, when the children of Israel were being rebellious, the Holy Spirit's Shekinah glory of God that's lifted from the Holy of Holies and it's gone and it's stood at the side of the, the holy place. And then it goes and it stands at the gate entering into the whole tabernacle area. And then finally it goes across the valley and it hovers on the hill on the east, the Mount of Olives side, the eastern gate. And there's where it finally is going to depart. Each stop, you just sense that the Spirit of the Lord didn't want to leave didn't want to leave, being so grieved because they would not believe, they would not accept, they would not be obedient, and he begins to, to back up from them. And if they would have caught that and felt that, that should have been correction. The same way when we are being corrected, if you, if you mark it at the first and you get straight now, you don't go to worse, but if you don't, then the, the correction it becomes harsher and the circumstances become even harder for you because you've moved away. Well, the Holy Spirit, the, that Shekinah glory of God that has backed up, that stood there, that it was prophesied would not go through the eastern gate again until Messiah would come in his glory. That's what has been removed. And now in Ezekiel, that's what's returned. And it's not just hovering over the holy place or the holy of holies place. It's filling the whole temple. It's the resurrected Shekinah, power of glory of our Lord in his majesty. Come back, ruling and reigning in all his glory. And it can't be contained. You know how excited we get. And I love the word ineffable, that our God is too big to be fit into a word or a phrase. It's just too much to contain. It's putting the whole ocean in a teacup and you can't do it. You couldn't put all the glory of the Lord in one little area. It fills the whole and how glorious it must be. And that is what is going to be down on earth for the people to come into and just bask in his glory, come in with their offerings to praise him and to worship him. And, oh, I can only imagine the joy that they'll carry out with them as they go back home, the blessings following them and filling the face of this earth like it's never been before. Wow. I love it. I love it. I read the final chapter. <laughs> I can hardly wait. And that's even just the beginning because it just gets better and better the more we move out into eternity. But here's what we're reading here, and I want you to catch nothing like this. Nothing like this has been in the first temple. Nothing like this was in the second temple. The first temple had a glory that when the second temple was rebuilt, the people who remembered the first cried because it was such a disappointment. It didn't hold a candle to it. Well, can you imagine the glory at this one? Far exceeds all of this before. This is going to be an amazing sight to see and to see it in the land of Israel where there's been for the last seven years prior to it, bloodshed that finally culminates so high, it's as high as a horse's bridle, almost the length of the land of Israel, over almost, uh, almost 200 miles. Wow, what a contrast. Israel's never seen the likes of this, and I can't wait for her to. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It will happen. Look with me at Amos, Amos chapter 9, verse 11. Just one quick verse. But I want us to glory in it. I want us to see the glory of the Lord. I want you to catch a vision. I want you to taste it and to feel it and to touch it. Promised. Remember how he started out and he said, God keeps his promises? Well, here we go. On that day, verse 11, Amos 9, 11. On that day, I will raise up the fallen shelter, the fallen tabernacle of David. And wall up its gaps. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as the days of old. 
he's going to restore the tabernacle of David. He's going to restore the temple that we saw. He is going to bring his glory into it. It will be more beautiful than the first one, which they give credit to uh, in David's day, but it really was his son Solomon, Shlomo, who got to build it. But that is it's going to be greater than that. Now, keeping that in mind, and the role that must come from it, now we look at Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah chapter 6 verses 12 and 13 that I referred to earlier and I want to read them for you now because this sums it all up okay um, the Lord of Armies says behold are you awake are word, you paying yes. attention there's our word again wake up people okay <laughs> behold there is a man whose name is the branch. Now we're going to see from the description of this man, this is not just a human man. This is the God man. This is the one who's fully God and who is fully man. There's a man whose name is the branch. Anyone know what that name is in Hebrew? Some of you hear all the time because of our ministries. Go for it, and Unmute. Go for it. Say it. She's trying to unmute. I want a little feedback. We're trying. We're all trying to get you there, Anne. Roger's trying to. There you go. Okay. The Messiah. Yes, but the name in Hebrew? Can you say branch in Hebrew? Branch. I put her on the spot now. <clears throat> Poor thing. <laughs> Those of you who are around me, you should be jumping with this. What's the name of our global ministries? Samak, I saw it, Beatrice. <laughs> I saw it. Samak. It's the name you hear all the time. It's tied in with, with Hebrew Christian Witness. I don't want you to miss the name because this is where we drew it from. What and in fact, it? because Samak. Samak? Samak. T as in Tom. S as in Sam. E as in Edward. M as in Miriam. <laughs> A as in Adam. C as in Christ. And H as in Heaven. Samak. That name means the branch that springs forth and fills the face of the earth. When we were looking for the name for our ministry, Outreach Together, Pastor Gil and I, which we will celebrate 10 years tomorrow. That's why I love this right now. He's coming at me, you know, he's trying to think and I'm trying to think. And at the same time, he's saying to me, how do you say the branch in Hebrew? I'm coming to him with, what do you think about Samak? It means the branch. And we knew it. Boom. That was it. And we moved forward, got the name. Actually, we the name got um, what you do with the state on February 11th. We'd come up with it the week before, but we immediately put it in the process so that it would be our name. That's how it came about. God brought two minds together, and this is what we based it on. There is a man whose name is Samak. For, uh, for he will branch out from where he is. He's going to, to be in Jerusalem, but his work, his, his kingdom, his authority is going to branch out. It's going to fill the whole face of the earth. He will build the temple of the Lord. Uh, he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord. He will bear the majesty. He's going to wear the crown. He will sit and rule on his throne. So, so it's Messiah. It's Messiah. Oh, you yeah. got it, Pam. You're right on target. So he <laughs> will like, be... Who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> that's who he is. Messiah is the only one who fits, and here he is in the roles. He will be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace, which means king, which means ruler, will be on his throne. And there will be peace between the two offices. This is king and priest brought together. We know that he is the prophet sent from God. This is the only one in all of scripture from beginning to end that does all three roles. Prophet, priest, and king. This is the one who will fill the face of the earth with his authority and ruling, and at the same time be a priest to the people, and he will rule and reign so that there will be shalom. That is the millennial kingdom in a nutshell. That is beyond anything this world has known. And after what it will come through, oh, how beautiful and how gorgeous it is. Jerusalem will be the center for the world government. The Lord's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. I think I've made it clear, but uh, 
Let me bring into you, let's go to Psalm. We haven't done a Psalm today. Tehillim, Psalm 48. 48? Yeah. Okay, I was thinking 46 in my mind. That'll come up later in my notes, I'm sure. But we'll go to 48 because that's what I put down earlier. Verse 1 and 2. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised, in the city of our God. What's the name of his city? New Jerusalem. Well, let's take the new one because it's Jerusalem. He's ruling on earthly Jerusalem. Yes, the new Jerusalem in the heavens always. But we're talking about on earth. Beautiful in elevation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. Mount Zion. In the far north, the city of the great king. He will rule from Jerusalem. Verse 8, just as we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of armies, in the city of our God, God will establish her forever. God's rule will be from Jerusalem forever. That is something Jerusalem's pregnant for and in need of, but uh, far removed from that right now. It, it is not just and fair judgment that's going out. She's not being treated justly, nor is she acting in justice toward others either. And it will only get worse. I'm going to, uh, real quickly, I'm going to go to Yeshaya, Isaiah 65, verses 17 to 25. We're going to see that there's also the new Jerusalem because it says in 17, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. We're going to talk about that. That's still coming. The former things will not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing. When he makes the new heavens and the new earth, he does not do away with Jerusalem, but he brings her up to even a higher level, even a more heavenly level. Her people will be for gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem, be glad in my people. There will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. No longer will there be an infant who only lives a few days or an old person who doesn't live out his days. This is the millennial time. They can live out the thousand years. The youth will die at 100. The one who does not reach, reach the age of 100 will be thought a curse. The only reason why they'll die is because they've brought judgment on themselves. They will build houses. This is the earthly people. They will inhabit them. Now, throughout Jewish history, they would build houses. They would be sent uh, fight in war, lose the battle, be kicked out of their own land, and others lived in their houses. They will not plant and another eat. Now they'll plant and they'll be there for the harvest. Someone else won't get it. For the lifetime of a tree, and you know how long a tree can last, so will be the days of my people. If you didn't, go look up my tremendous teachings of the trees. It's amazing what you'll learn from the trees in Scripture. Here it is saying they'll be able to live long like a tree, and my chosen ones will fully enjoy the work of their hands. They're not going to labor in vain. They're not going to give birth to children for disaster. They're not going to lose their children in war. For they are the descendants of those blessed by the Lord, and their descendants with them, their, their children and their grandchildren will receive the blessings of the Lord. And it keeps on going down. And that, it will also come to pass that before they call, I'll answer. While they're still speaking, I will listen. And here we have again, the wolf and the lamb will graze together. The lion will eat straw, not the lamb. He'll eat straw like the ox, and the dust will be the serpent's food. They will do no evil or harm on all my holy mountain. That's peace. That starts in the center uh, with world government from Jerusalem, the Lord ruling there, and the whole earth will uh, receive the results of it. You and know, when Palestine had the land, they didn't do anything with it. They just let it go decay. <coughs> and then when the Jewish food people moved in there, they made it beautiful and prosperous, and now the Palestinians want to take it away from them. But, so. <laughs> and the same way we talked about before, when they gave back Sinai, they gave back full resort, you know, everything going well for it, and the, the Egyptian people supposedly wanted it, but all they wanted was to cut Israel's size down. They let it deteriorate. They let it go to pot. They didn't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. They don't have a care and love for it that God's given the Jewish people for well, they don't care for the land. They just want to... They just want the peace Jewish called Israel so that they can wipe Israel off the face of the right. map. That's their credence and their goal. And we are not talking about all the people. We are talking about those, the, the head leaders that are antagonistic against Israel. Yes, Maria? Um, 
what is interesting, um, it, you know, it just came to mind that it, it brought me back to Genesis, and he says they will be. Um, he says that the wolf and the lamb will graze together, and the lion will eat uh, straw like an ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. So the serpent will still be cursed. Yes, the serpent never will be what it was before, yes. And I, I think it is because of the representation. It's standing for Satan, you know, that that is not, you know, changed, yes. Yes, but it's also it's true that the serpent won't strike the enemy and bring death to the enemy. So we see a bit removed, but, but yes, it is interesting. I've thought of that before too, and just kind of ponder on that. Don't really have total closure, you know. It's just very interesting to think about. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Okay, let me show you that there's celebration of Jewish worship going on from Jerusalem also. Just go right next door to chapter 66 of Isaiah. You're in 65, go to 66. And verse 20, Then they shall bring all your countrymen from all the nations as a grain offering to the Lord. Okay, so the Jewish people are going to come from all over. The others are going to come with them also. They're going to come in chariots and litters on mules and camels. They're all coming up to the holy mountain of Jerusalem, just as the sons of Israel, because remember Israel's been brought back into the land bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord. So they're all coming in, bringing their offerings to the Lord. That's the worship that's going to be going on from there. And if you can hear my phone in the background, just ignore it. It's because I left it upstairs. But just as the new heavens and the new earth I'll make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your descendants and your name endure. Israel will continue on forever. It goes on, it talks about the new moons, the Sabbath. They're still going to have, in the millennium especially, they're still going to have the, the Feast of Israel going on, and all are going to come up and celebrate that. We'll talk about more of that in just a bit also. And the, the final battle that will come up a lot, come with Satan will not happen until the end of the millennium, and it will end in his departure into the lake of fire forever. So that gives you a great overview of what the millennium is going to look like, what it will be like. Let me hit on some highlights that continue with it, though. Um, we've already talked about how Messiah will rule with the rod of iron during that time, so that it's righteous rule, that he is the branch we talked about today that he will have under him those who are called princes. We'll talk more about that in a bit, so I won't look up the verses now. His reign is over all of the earth, not just Jerusalem, not just Israel, but over all the earth. But he reigns from Jerusalem. He reigns from Israel. Uh, I think we've looked at this in detail enough. He is the king of kings. Revelation 19.16 tells us that, that that's how he comes back. And the others that will rule under him... I will show you now because it's coming up in my notes now. I will show you that there are princes, there are priests, there are shepherds, and there are judges, and there are even his Talmudim, all ruling, but they're ruling under him in this, in this millennial kingdom. Go with me to chapter 32 of Isaiah, since you're right there still, if you kept it. Just go to verse uh, chapter 32 and verse 1. Behold... A king will reign righteously. Okay, we get it. This is when King Messiah is on the throne. Officials will rule justly. Or your um, version can read right there, princes will rule justly. He is king. He has princes, those who are under him. Okay, let's look at some other verses and we'll see all of this. Revelation 5.10. Revelation 5, we saw that, that this is when Satan wants to go after the woman and her child. Um, no, that's, ch that's 12, sorry. Ignore, I just said that's 12.5. I reversed it in my mind. 5 is the heavenly scene. It's the Lord having the scroll, which is the grant deed to the earth, and he's the one able to open that, that scroll. The only one who was found who could, because he redeemed the earth by his shed blood. Verse 10, he says, you've made them into a kingdom and priests to our God. They will reign upon the earth. So there will be priests reigning with the Lord on the earth. There will be uh, those that we read about in chapter 20 and verse 6. 
20 and verse 6. Remember, 20 is our millennial chapter. Verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, will reign with him for a thousand years. So between these two verses, we've got those who are in our category, who are in this age today, this called out assembly time that we call a church, for a, a word that puts it all together, that we will be priests that rule with him. But now we also see from Revelation 20, we've got those who made it, who didn't make it through the tribulation, Physically, those who were beheaded we had in, in verse 4, but they're resurrected to rule and reign as princes also. Okay, then we see the priests, the priests that the, there will be priests during this time. Isaiah 61, I should have told you to keep a finger there, but um, hopefully you, you did. My tablet's going to give you time to go back anyway because I don't know how to type today. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 6 tells us that the priests, Okay, so we have princes and we have priests, but you will be called the priests of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God. You will eat the wealth of nations, boast in their riches, and it goes on. So we've got the Lord ruling. We've got princes ruling with him. Um, and that's easy to see. A king and his son is easy to see. That's the idea. But there's also priests that will be doing priestly work for the Lord. Then there's shepherds. Look at your man, Jeremiah. In the book right after Isaiah, Jeremiah chapter 23, and we are going to look at verses 2 through 4. Jeremiah 23 verse 2 says, Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the shepherds who are tending my people. So, especially the shepherds over Israel. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, have not been concerned about them. Behold, I'm going to call you to account for the evil of your deeds. Those false leaders that are not leading the sheep to God are going to be judged for it. Then, verse 3, I myself, the Lord, will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them. Bring them back to their pasture. Where's their pasture? Israel. He's gathered them to the world. He's going to bring them back. They will be fruitful and multiply. We know this is during the millennium when God brings them back. All the Jewish people from the four corners of the earth puts them in their own land. And he says in verse 4, I will raise up shepherds over them. They will tend them. They will not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified, nor will any be missing. Not one lost sheep. Right now we see the shepherd, the great shepherd, go out, leave the 99 safe in the fold, and go look for the one that is lost. But in that day, not one will be lost. And they will be safe in the fold of the land of Israel with shepherds over them who will be godly shepherds guiding them in the ways of the great chief shepherd. The one who we call today the branch, the one who is Messiah and Savior. And then look at what he promises his Talmudim, those disciples that followed him in his earthly life. In Matthew 19 and verse 28, we see they're not left out. Matthew 19 and verse 28 says, And Yeshua Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, so when the world is redeemed, when he's sitting on his throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. In the millennial kingdom we're going to see, we'll talk about it shortly, that we have uh, the nation divided so that each tribe has their portion of land, and apparently each one is going to have one of the Talmudim sitting over their area, judging them, taking care of their needs, helping them follow the ways of the Lord. Okay? We'll get more of that as we go on. Israel is the head nation, the, um, and Jerusalem is the capital. I've said it and said it and said it, but let's let Scripture say it. Deuteronomy 28. Davarim, verse 28. Uh, sorry, chapter 28, verse 13. <laughs> okay, Deuteronomy 28, 13 says... The Lord will make you, speaking to Israel, will make you the head and not the tail. You will not only be above, but you will not be underneath. If you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I'm commanding you today to follow them. Israel was promised that originally. God will be able to give them that promise. He will be faithful to his word. 
when they are right with him in the millennial time. So Israel will be the head nation. Isaiah chapter 2. I think we already read this, but let's go back to it. Isaiah 2. We're looking at verses 2 and 3. I think I did. Yes, I did read it. Okay, but I'll read it again. Now will come in the last days. The mountains of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains, raised above the hills. All the nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, so he may teach us about his ways. We may walk in his paths, for the law will go out from Zion, 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 and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So here we see the word of the Lord is going to be going out, what they're going to live by. The judgment is going to come from Jerusalem. Look at chapter 24, Isaiah 24, verse 23. Isaiah 24 and verse 23. Then the moon will be ashamed and the sun put to shame. When does that happen? Tribulation. Very end of it. Remember it talks about the, the, the sun the, the, would, in essence, like burn itself out. That the moon would be turned to blood. We see the manifestation in the uh, heavenlies of, of the horrors that are going on. At that time, for the Lord of armies will reign on Mount Zion. At that time, when all of those manifestations are happening, it culminates in the Lord's return, and he sets up. He comes back with his armies, Revelation 19. And he sets up to rule on Mount Zion, in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before his elders. They will see. Those who are under him will see his glory. We see it in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 3. All of these are telling us the same thing, that, that um, the rule and the reign goes from Jerusalem, the capital of Israel. Um, they can fight over it today, but God has the final word. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 17. At that time they will call Jerusalem, what are they going to call it? The throne of the Lord. Then where do you think his throne is sitting? You think it's in Timbuktu? No. <laughs> you think it's in, in the United States? You think it's in England? No, it's going to be in Jerusalem. All the nations will assemble at it. All of them will come up to it at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord. And they will no longer follow the stubbornness of their evil heart. That's what's needed. The stubborn evil heart is what wreaks the havoc over the face of this earth. But finally that judgment will come. The Lord will return set up his kingdom, rule and reign, and there will be all of this peace because they are in obedience to him. Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah 8, we're going to look at verse 3. Whoops, and again my typing is bad today. Okay, Zechariah 8 and verse 3 says, The Lord says this, I will return to Zion. Dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Now, if the Lord says it, Believe it. Then Jerusalem will be called, and I love it, it will be called the city of truth. Who called himself the truth? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father, Jehovah, but through the Son. This one who calls himself truth, sitting on the throne in Jerusalem, in, on Mount Zion, in the midst of Jerusalem, this is the one that causes a whole city to be called. It's the city of truth. And the mountain of the Lord of Armies will be called the Holy Mountain. Ah, I can hardly wait to see that for Israel. Go to chapter 14 of Zechariah. Chapter 14. And we're going to look at verses 16 and 17. Zechariah 14, 16, and 17. Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that came against Jerusalem. So... All the nations that came against Jerusalem, they've been judged now. Any who are left are the ones who are believers, who have come into the kingdom. They will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of armies, to celebrate the Feast of Booths. That's Sukkot. That's one of the times they'll come up to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. It will be whatever families of the earth does not go to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of armies. There will be no rain on them. All, if all the family of Egypt does not go up and enter, then no rain will fall on them. It will be the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations that do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. If you know you've been threatened, you want rain, you've got to come up, you're going to go because the nations, the land needs the rain so that the crops can grow. But you can see again and again and again, Israel will be head nation. 
Jerusalem will be the capital. That's why we call it today the eternal capital of our holy God. And any who dare come against it even today, look out because I believe God's wrath falls on those who come against it even today. As we talked about earlier, the Davidic kingdom, the kingdom of David, will be restored. Let me show you that. Again, we're going back to Amos, Amos chapter 9. It might be what we read before, but we'll go ahead and look real quickly again. I think we did. I think this is the one where it talks about raising the tabernacle of David. Um, yes, it is. Okay. Amos, Amos, Amos 9, 11, and 12. And I did read it. I read 11 before that the, on that day he'll raise up the fallen tabernacle or shelter, depending on what your scripture says, of David, wall up its gaps, raise up its ruins, rebuild it as in the days of old. Verse 12 so they may possess the remnant of Edom. Edom came against them. Edom was an enemy. They're going to absorb Edom. All the nations are called by my name declares the Lord who does this. So we see, again, Israel being the main, Jerusalem being the, the center of it. But we see he's raising up David's kingdom again. Let me show you why that's so important. Go with me into the new covenant, the Brit Hadashah. We're going to go to the book of Acts, and we're going to go to chapter 15 in the book of Acts. And here we have the Council of Jerusalem taking place. It's when they were trying to decide what did the Gentiles have to do? What should they not do? Because they, they were not accustomed to Jew and Gentile coming together in worship of the one true and living God. But now they were on that equal footing. Now the Gentile doesn't have to proselyte into Judaism and keep the sacrificial system because the sacrifice of all time has been made by the Lamb of God who gave his own blood on the altar, raised from the dead. And now we have the one new man. We have what we refer to in Ephesians 2, where the middle wall of separation, and that was a sorel, was a, a, a literal shorter wall, but it was a wall that separated the court of the Gentiles from the court of the Jews. And the Gentiles knew they could cross no further. There were even signs up that if they went across into the Jewish area they didn't belong in, that death could come upon them. There could, they could be judged that severely for it. Now that wall is gone. And the Lord has said, you both come in on equal footing together, whether you're Jewish or whether you're Gentile. You both come through the shed blood of Yeshua, Jesus. Nothing else now. You don't have to come through the law and all of its, keeping all of its commandments to show. Now you come through the shed blood of Yeshua. So as they're trying to figure out how to, to work together as a people, the, the council has to come together and take care of um, some of the bigger issues. The little issues, you know, will work their ways out, but they're eventually going to tell the Gentiles four things to stay away from so that they're not stumbling blocks to the Jews and so they can get along. But here Peter is describing, he's, verse 15 says, uh, Peter's described how God first concerned himself about taking a people of his name from among the Gentiles. That was the new thought. Remember, even when God wanted to open that door, Kepha, Peter, had a vision. He saw a sheep come down out of heaven. It had non-kosher animals in it, and God told Peter, kill and eat. And he had to do it three times. Peter's saying, no way. I, I keep kosher, Lord. I'm a good Jew. I'm not going to defile myself. But God was preparing his heart to see that the Gentiles were not to be excluded and that they were to, to be brought in, that the, the message was to go to them also, and they were not to be considered unclean that this was a new way the Lord was working. And so he had to prepare Peter by what he showed him. And then the next thing you know is there's that knock on the door. God had told, sorry, shadow, don't bark. <laughs> God had told Peter that, that he was to go with these men. They went to the house of Cornelius. This was, a, he was Italian. He was Gentile. He was a ruler. He had people under him, an army, um, uh, I can't think of the word, but he had like a battalion under him. Anyway, he was he had he was called a God fearer. He had a love for God, and God is about to reveal to him the truth of coming in through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus, where they would receive the Holy Spirit in their life the same way that the Jewish people did. And we know that's what happened. That is, Peter realized, oh, hey, I'm supposed to go into the house of a Gentile under Jewish law. That wasn't kosher. And there, there would be punishment for that. But now, that Gentile that he was to go to and bring the gospel message was not considered unclean. They both were being brought in 
and clean through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. So in that council, they're talking about all of these things. So it's, Peter's trying to help the people understand, hey, God used me. He took me, put me in a Gentile house, and the same thing fell on those Gentiles that fell on us in that upper room 50 days after uh, Passover when the Lord had ascended into heaven and we were to wait and the Holy Spirit came on us. The same thing happened over here. The Holy Spirit came on them, the same as he did on the Jewish people. It was a whole new thought, really? The, the Gentiles? Yes, the Gentiles. They're being grafted in. They're being brought in into that same root. And so he's telling that, and he's telling them the words of the prophets agree with this. This is verse 15. Verse 16, after these things, I will return. The Lord saying, I will return. I will rebuild the fallen tabernacle of David. Does that sound like what we just read back in Isaiah? Yes, it is what we just read in Isaiah. I will rebuild its ruins. I will restore it so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. And now get it and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. So now it's not just for the Jews who are called in by the name of the Lord, it's for the Gentiles who are called in by the name of the Lord. Verse 18 says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. Hey guys, I prophesied this way back. I prophesied it through Isaiah. 700 years earlier, I prophesied this. Here we are seeing the fulfillment now of Jew and Gentile brought in together. This is the restoration. When I bring up David's tabernacle, when I restore his kingdom, it is for Jew and Gentile, one new man, to come in and rejoice together. Um, also, look at Jeremiah 33 and verse 17. Jeremiah 33 and verse 17. Here we read, For this is what the Lord says, David, David, shall not lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. How is he not going to lack a man right now? There's no temple, there's no throne, but when God raises it back up, when we see it established in the millennial kingdom, there will be one sitting on the throne forever. God is faithful to his word. He also said in 2 Samuel 7 that the, the throne of David would be established in the house of Israel forever. That is what is coming and that is what will be done. We've got a Jewish population explosion during the millennium because they don't die if they don't outright sin. They can live out the time. So we have a, a population that is growing. We see the pouring out of the Holy Spirit as I've already mentioned on the people that they can worship and they can live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. We see that, that there will be economic blessing for Israel and for the Gentiles. Remember, we've got that equal footing. We've got them coming together. Let me show you for the Gentiles first. That's in Micah, Micha, chapter 4. And it's verses 2 to 4. Whoops, I can't seem to type right today. Oh, okay, try again. Micah 4, verses 2 to 4. Many nations will come and say, Come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, so that he may teach us his ways and we may walk in his paths. For from Mount Zion will go forth the law. God still keeps his law. He's always one with law. Because without rule, without law, it's, it's anarchy. It's, it's terror. But his law is perfect. It's not unjust. He's going to teach their ways that, that they may walk in his paths. For from Mount Zion will go forth the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. That means a ways away from Israel. Then it goes on and says, again, what we read in um, Isaiah earlier, that they'll beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. They will not war against each other anymore. And verse 4 tells them instead they're going to each have their own vine, sit under their own fig tree. This, again, who was it saying it was to? To the nations afar. This is to the others, not just to Israel. What about Israel, though? Will Israel see her blessings? Yes, finally. Finally, because she's right with her God. She's okay. able to. Isaiah 27 and verse 6. In the days to come, Yaakov, Jacob, will take root. Israel will blossom and sprout, and they will fill the whole world with fruit. Now, we see a little 
fulfilling, but it will be a greater fulfilling. Why do I say that? Because I love to tell the story. My dad, and I'm going to say it probably was the 1980s, 1990s, uh, worked with a group called Christian Businessmen. They would eat in a local San Bernardino restaurant every week. They'd get together for breakfast before the men went to work. It was to strengthen the Christian businessmen. My dad would always help the waitress because she'd always managed to be outnumbered. All these men all needing, you know, help at the same time. So he would go into the kitchen. He, they'd been there so long, he had favor with the kitchen. He was allowed to go in, get a coffee pot, come out. He'd serve coffee and help also. So one day he goes into the kitchen, and there on the counter is a crate. He comes back out to the people. He says, gentlemen, I want you to know, those of you who drank orange juice today, your oranges came from Jaffa, Israel. They were fresh squeezed oranges from Jaffa that they were drinking in San Bernardino, California. We think, wow, that was exciting. But here in the millennium, that's going to be happening all over. That's going to be the normal, that Israel's going to bless the world with her fruit. So she's when blessed they carry and she's cluster of grapes, is that in the millennium? When it's so big that it takes like four it, to carry a cluster of grapes. I believe it will be like that again. She's asking about so the cluster of grapes. It's not now. It's not now. It was when Israel was to go into the promised land at first. Remember, God promised them a land flowing with milk and honey, a land that would have all seven different species of, of fruits that were were um, blossoming. And that's when the spies went in, and they did come back with the cluster so big that it took two of them to carry the clusters of grapes. Mm -hmm. That's how the land was. Had they stayed in right fellowship with their God, they would have enjoyed that continually. Since that time, there's been judgment that has come. The land is not in that position, but I believe with the, the curse being removed, the, in the millennium will see it fruitful like that so that it has that much that it can share in that way. So, and then we'll see so into eternity. So it happened back then and it'll happen again. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Look at chapter 30, verses 23 and 24. Isaiah 30. Oh, I'm in 27 still. I thought I moved to it. Isaiah 30. And we're going to look at 23 and 24. Okay. Then he will give you rain for your seed, which you will sow in the ground, bread from which from the yield of the ground, and it will be rich and plentiful on that day. Your livestock will graze in wide pasture. This is the promise to Israel, that they would have plenty of bread, that there would be so much for their cattle, for the pastures of the field. Um, we're looking at Israel's blessings now. Chapter 61 of Isaiah. In 61 verses 5 and 6 we have strangers, that's the Gentiles, will stand and pasture your flocks. Foreigners will be your farmers and your vine dressers. So the Gentiles are going to be coming in and helping them because they've got so much in their vineyards and so much on their, their fields that need to be harvested, need to be taken care of. That, that's going on. But you, Israel, will be called the priests of the Lord. You'll be spoken of as ministers of our God. You'll eat the wealth of nations. You'll boast in their riches. Remember when the Gentiles come up, bring their offerings to the Lord? Israel's going to eat from that. We, we just see, you know, that, that um, the Gentile nations will, at this time, be blessing Israel instead of cursing her like they do today. And they will bring blessing to the land. Chapter 65, verse 21. 65 and 21. Okay, again, they'll plant houses, inhabit them, plant vineyards, eat the fruit, and it's saying that they won't, you know, they won't build and, and be cast out, and they won't plant, and somebody else gets to harvest. I'm going to give you some other verses because we've touched on all of these. Jeremiah 31, verse 12. Jeremiah 32, verse 15. Jeremiah 33, verses 12 and 13. Let me give you another source, Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 26 and 27, chapter 36, verses 33 to 38. I don't think we've looked at Joel today. Let's look real quick at Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, verse 21, Yoel, 
says, Do not fear, land. Shout for joy and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Do not fear, animals of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness have turned green. The trees produce its fruit. The fig tree, the vine, have yielded in full. Shout for joy, you sons of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain for your vindication. He's brought down for you the rain, the early and the latter rain as before. And if they didn't have, and to this day is true, Israel needs early rain and it needs late rain to produce good abundant crops. Here they're being promised that their threshing floors will be full of grain. Their vats will overflow with new wine and oil. Then I will compensate you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten. The creeping locust, the stripping locust, it goes on. God's going to restore all the years that the locusts ate. All the years that they didn't get what they should, the Lord is restoring it to them now. You can keep reading Joel all the way down through verse 27. Um, well, 27, let me read that. I love it. So you will know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God. There is no other, and my people will never be put to shame. That's how I know this is millennium. This is not past. The world has never known the Lord in the midst of Israel, that he is their God and that their, that his people will never be put to shame, not true to this very day, will be true in the millennium. Amos again, chapter 9, verses 13 to 15, and Zechariah 8, verses 12 and 13. Not 9, 15? 9. Amos, what is Amos? Amos is 9, 13 to 15. 13. And Zechariah. We're, we're doing Amos. I do it every Wednesday night. So, in the book of Amos. I never knew that was uh, the same. As it was God's wrath on the people. And they talk about human trafficking and all kinds of stuff that we're in today. They did back then. Nothing new under the sun. They sold, they sold people for the price of a pair of sandals right. in the Bible. Can you believe that? Can you believe that they actually even offered human sacrifice? Yeah. Never pleasing to God. Never his choice. Mm. But let me tell you, the curse is removed from the, the vegetable kingdom because it couldn't produce like it's doing if the curse had not. When did that curse begin? All the way back. Genesis, Bereshit, chapter 3, verses 17 to 19, when curse came on the earth as well as on man. Man now would die man you know has to suffer the consequences of their sin but it brought a curse on the earth also let me read it for you um because just in case i'm taking for granted that you're familiar with it but um we'll read it real quickly genesis 3 verses 17 to 19 then to Adam he said, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife, eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. With hard labor you'll eat from it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles will grow for you. You shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread until you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return." All of that. The ground is cursed. He'd have to work hard to feed himself, to take care of his family, and ultimately in the end, his excuse me, body would return to the dust of the earth also. That's the curse that was given. But now, let me read to you Romans 8. Romans 8, 19. It says, For the eagerly awaiting creation waits the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. Verse 21 that the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. What's that saying? That saying creation is suffering like a woman who's about to give birth. Those birth pains that are hard and they hurt, creation's feeling that it's waiting it's suffering it can't wait to be released from this curse that was put upon it and here now we're reading of the release of that curse that god's blessings can flow because now they've come into right fellowship with their god isaiah 55 verses 12 and 13 say for you will go out with joy be led in peace mountains and the hills will break into shouts of joy before you the trees of the field will clap their hands 
We don't see anything like that today, do we? That's personification given in scripture, but I wonder how much we'll see in some way. I think we're going to hear like the trees are clapping their hands and we're going to hear shouts of joy from the mountains. You know, we hear the beauty through the sounds. The alien, or however you say that, alien, I can't say that, harp. That when it's out in, in the open and the wind goes through, pr puts out beautiful music as if someone was strumming it. Well, I, nature's waiting to sing the beauties of the Lord because it's been put under that curse. And here we're reading that the, it's going to be released from that. Chapter 35, a beautiful um, chapter of what Israel will be like, blossoming like the rose in, in chapter 35, verse 1 says, the wilderness, the desert will rejoice. It will shout for joy. It will blossom like the crocus. It will blossom profusely. Rejoice with joy and jubilation. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon, those are mountains in Israel. They will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Everything's just going to boom, blossom, be beautiful. Mm -hmm. Everything. Is, if we yeah, think yeah. this creation is is telling us how yeah. great our God is today, the redwoods, wait the till you see it. Think that's gorgeous. And wait till nothing, you see it. Right. She's saying the redwoods waterfalls. and the waterfalls that we think are gorgeous today. Yeah. Wait till you see it then. Wow. I mean, it, it, it's like everything, you know, if you've ever grown a perfect rose, as close as you can get to it, well, the whole rose bush is going to be full of the perfect roses and it's going to multiply and it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. I could give you more verses. I can give them to you. There's so many verses I'm not going to bother at this point but let me tell you Ezekiel that you already have down will allude to this and Joel again also. So in that type of creation the animal kingdom is released from it. Isaiah 65, 25. I think that's, and I'm going there because we're in Isaiah, but I think that's the lion and the lamb, if I remember right. Animals. Ezekiel. Did you say animals? Yes, released? the animal kingdom are released from animal the curse. Kingdom. Yes. Right now there's the curse. Right now. Yeah, the, that's why they kill people and kill each other. Kill each other and kill people, and that's what it's saying. In verse 25 of Isaiah, um, what am I in? 65. 65? Is that where I went? Yes. Okay, the wolf and the lamb will graze together. They're not going to be the wolf it might killing. Be there. <laughs> yes, the lion and the lamb, like like my uh, poster. Yes, yeah. They and we've already read that verse. They'll do no evil or harm. They're not going to hurt each other. It's not going to suddenly happen. Go back to chapter eleven in Isaiah, and we'll see it there also. Chapter eleven. We want to look at verses six to nine. And it tells us, again, the wolf will dwell with the lamb, the leopard with the young goat, the calf. I think I did read this. But let me bring out this part. The end of verse 6, a little boy will lead them. Would you have a little boy lead a lion today? No, you wouldn't take the chance. You know what would happen. The cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the axe. The nursing child will play on the hole of the cobra. Right now, the cobra would kill that child. The weaned child will put his hand on the very viper's den. Weaned child is a young child. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So again, and then we also have, look up on your own, Ezekiel 34, verses 25 and 28. The animal kingdom is released from the curse. The vegetable kingdom is released from the curse. The human body, the healing that will be there. Let's look at that, Isaiah 29. Are you getting the idea it's like a utopia? Mm -hmm. That's a good way to put it, but it's yeah. a real utopia. It's not hope pie in the sky, you know, I hope so by and by. Right. No, yeah. God promised it, and mm -hmm. he's faithful to his word. Isaiah 29, verse 18 says, On that day those who are deaf will hear, I lost my place here, words of a book. They can hear a book being read. Out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of those who are blind, they'll see. The afflicted will increase their joy in the Lord. The needy of mankind will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. So the deaf are going to hear. The blind are going to yeah, see. they need the deaf. <laughs> now the blessing will be when I can hear again. <laughs> Pam is relating. She says the blessing will be when I can hear again. And yes, <laughs> excuse me, what a blessing it will be. Um, Am I still in 35? No. Go back to 35. 
Isaiah 35, and this time, let's look at verses 5 and the start of 6. The eyes of the blind are open, ears of the deaf unstopped. Those who limp will leap like the deer. The tongue of those who can't speak will shout for joy. Waters will burst burst forth in the wilderness, streams in the desert. Everything is going to be the way God had intended it for them in the beginning. Hezekiel, Ezekiel 47. And this, remember, is in the middle of the temple, um, the, script, the chapters on the temple. Uh, in verse 12, we read there, By the river on its banks, on one side and on the other, will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither. Their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and the leaves for healing. And we read in Revelation that the trees, the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the people. So uh, here is where we can have an infant live, be considered a, a still child at 100 years. The old man dies at a thousand years. You know, the, the aging process is not here any longer. Look at Zechariah. Zechariah, I think we read it, but let's look at it again. Chapter 8 and verse 4. I think we did read that. Yeah, the Lord of Armies says this. Old men, old women, will again sit in the public scares of Jerusalem, each person with a staff in his hand because of age. So you know they've gotten older. It's not that it's all, all gone and nobody ages. The child grows up. The, the old people do age, but they're, they're not aging decrepitly. They're not deteriorating. They're, you, know, they're, you see age. They've got their staff, but they're able to live. The, the curse isn't there to stop the um, aging um, process like, like is true now. Hmm? Are we talking heaven? No, we're talking millennial kingdom. I, oh, the millennial there kingdom. Too. Oh, that's right. We, yeah. we live to a, a, some can live to 150 and God. Some can live to a thousand and during the millennium. They can be born millennium. very close to the oh, beginning yeah, of it. When they're a hundred, they're, they're a child. Right. That's what it Right. Is. That's yeah, what the scripture said. said. Yes. No. Okay. Yes. We are talking millennium. We're not talking us. We have a body that never ages. That's we right. have that. We the mortal put on immortality. Um, what's the other word? The immortality or, and. Uh, Corruption. Corruption, thank you. Puts on incorruption. So we don't decay and die anymore. We will have a body that lives on forever. But those who went into the millennial kingdom in their physical body, there will be aging seen, but they don't have to die. They don't come to that point. And they don't and, and there won't be the all the problems that you have today because if you need the healing from the trees, it'll be there and, and God just miraculously heals also so that they're not born blind born without being able to hear. No, it won't be like that then. They won't have gray hair either or wrinkles. Any of that stuff. <laughs> well, enough that the, the aged man's <clears throat> got his staff. But, you know, not I'm sure not in the same way we see it today and today, feel yeah. it today. Yeah. You know, no, yeah. no. Uh, but, but it does show a time process still for them is what I'm saying. No war for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. I don't think this earth is known a thousand days without a war or battle somewhere. Yeshia, Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 4 tells us, He will judge between the nations. He will mediate for the peoples. They'll beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning knives. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. So the armament is, is scrapped. Those weapons for war are going to be turned into other implements, and there is no budget for the military. There is no budget for for armory. All is gone. That is gone. Don't need the people, the personnel. Don't need the weapons. It's gone. Psalm 46 is also a picture of millennial time. It's a picture of um, the, the river that flows from the city of God. We'll read more about that in, in Revelation when we get there. But the verse I want you to see right now in relation to what we're saying is verse 9. Verse 9 says, Come, behold, oops, that's 8. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. All the way to the very end of the earth, he makes all the war stop. He breaks the bow, he cuts the spear in two. He gets rid of their weapons of war. He burns the chariots with fire. They're burned up, they're gone. That is all over with. How do I know this is millennium? Look at verse 5. 
It says, God is in the midst of her, and she will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth quaked. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Did I just go through the tribulation and right into the millennial? Yes. Read the whole chapter. Like I say, it's a beautiful chapter. Um, but see it in light of the and and verse 10 tells you also stop striving and know I am God I'll be exalted among the nations I will be exalted on the earth the Lord of armies is with us the God of Jacob is our stronghold have we not been talking about that our whole class that could sum up our, our verse our class discussion right there um, David, David is going to be resurrected. I think I can get through the last of this. We'll see if I can get into the temple, but I'm watching the clock. I know we're getting close, people. <laughs> um, David it will be resurrected and reign under Messiah. There's a lot of controversy on whether this is literal or not. Again, when God says it again and again and again and again, I tend to think he means it, and I tend to think he means it literally. You can take it symbolically, but where you can take scripture literally, I say do it, okay? And I see David called a king, I see David called a prince. Let's look at Jeremiah 30 and verse 9. And this is important because of what God promised in 2 Samuel that I told you about, where he promised that one would sit on the throne of David forever. And we don't see that yet, but when it starts a millennium, it will continue forever. Jeremiah 30 and verse 9 says, It shall come about on that day, declares the Lord of armies, I will break his yoke from their necks, I will tear to pieces their restraints, and strangers will no longer make them their slaves. Okay, this is the Lord stopping the war. He's stopping those who have come up against Israel. He is coming back with his armies. That's why he's called the Lord of armies. He breaks that they're coming. The stranger, the Gentile, will no longer make Israel their slaves. Okay, that's still not telling us about David, but let's hang on. Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34, and we're going to look at verses 23 and 24. Ezekiel 24, 23. Then I will appoint over them one shepherd. Okay, verse 22 tells us he's going to save his flock. We know when he's talking about his sheep, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, he's talking about the sheep of Israel that he saved. He will judge between one sheep and another. That's for the ones who go into the kingdom. The ones who were not believers will not. In that time then, verse 23, I just did you 22. Verse 23, then I will appoint over them one shepherd, my servant David. He will feed them. He will feed them himself and be their shepherd. Okay, and look at verse 24. It's important with that. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. So what I'm reading here is God's going to raise up David again to be a shepherd ruler, to be a servant ruler, to be a prince over Israel. He is prince, not king. He is under King Messiah who's sitting on the throne. But I believe David will be raised back up and sit on a throne also shepherding his people Israel, that this is what God has promised. Look at chapter 37. Chapter 37 Verses 24 and 25, we read, And my servant David will be king over them. Okay, Now, he's not been king over the whole earth. He's been king over Israel. They will have one shepherd. So he's a king shepherd. Okay, um, They'll walk in my ordinances. They will keep my statutes and follow them. So who are they being obedient to? King Messiah. But who's leading them, directing them, shepherding them? Uh, guiding them, teaching them, David. They will live on the land that I gave to my servant Yaakov, Jacob, in which your fathers lived. They will live on it, they, their sons, their sons, sons, forever. And my servant David will be their leader forever. See, he's saying it too many times and saying it specifically and, you know, zeroing in on it that I believe he is raising David back up to be in a position of authority that um, he was king, of course, in the past, but this is the future of Israel. Now look at Hosea chapter 3. Okay, we've got several different sources, again, of scripture, all saying the same thing. Chapter 3, verse 5. Afterward, the sons of Israel will return. Okay, after all the battles, he's brought Israel back, the Jewish people back into the land. They will seek the Lord their God and David their king. 
They will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. I believe, again, that's showing us that, that David is being raised up. There will be princes under David. Remember, we had princes and shepherds and priests and, and the Talmudim all ruling. David is one of the higher ups. God's always got his hierarchy and his order. And I just see David being brought back up. Isaiah 32.1. I should have told you to keep Isaiah. But it's close. And again, if you can't get there, I'm reading it for you anyway. Isaiah 32.1. Behold, a king will reign righteously, and princes will rule justly. David will be a prince. When it calls him a king, it's, a, it's an earthly king. It's not the heavenly king of kings. Um, Ezekiel 44, we looked at that earlier, but this time let's look at the first few verses. Ezekiel 44, I took you to verse 4, now I'm backing up 1 through 3. Then he brought me, Ezekiel, in the vision, back by way of the outer gate of the sanctuary, which faces east, and it was shut. Okay, so the eastern gate is shut. And then it says in verse 3, as for the prince, he shall sit in it as a prince to eat bread before the Lord. So it's not the Lord, it's a prince sitting before the Lord. He shall enter by way of the porch of the gate and shall go out by the same way. Now if we keep reading, we go to chapter 20, I'm sorry, 45, the very next chapter, and we read in verses 7 to 9, the prince shall have land on either side of the holy allotment. We'll talk about that holy area in a bit, okay? So it's telling, it's giving a description of that. And then verse 8 says, This shall be his land as a possession in Israel. So my princes, plural, shall no longer oppress my people, but they shall give the rest of the land to the house of Israel according to their tribes. So we see princes. We see an orderliness that is going on here, even when the temple of, of Israel is uh, the Millennial Temple is set up and established for a role. Go to chapter 46, the very next chapter, 46 verse 2. It says, The prince shall enter by the way of the porch of the gate. Um, and Okay, this is the one I want to read. The prince will enter by the porch of the way of the gate from outside and stand by the post of the gate. Then the priest shall provide his burnt offering and his peace offerings, and he shall worship at the threshold of the gate, and they go out, but the gate shall not be shut until the evening. So we're seeing that there's order going on, and they're doing sacrifices here at this time. Verse 12, when the prince provides a voluntary offering, a burnt offering or peace offerings unto the Lord, voluntary offering unto the Lord, the gate facing the east shall be open for him. Okay, so now this prince is making offerings unto the Lord. That means it's not the Lord. It's someone who is under the Lord. And this, I believe, is a picture of David. And David will make sacrifices unto the Lord as he has before. Verse 16. This is what the Lord God says. If the prince gives a gift from his inheritance to any of his sons, it belongs to his sons. It's their possession by inheritance. But if he gives a gift from his, from his inheritance to one of his servants, it shall be there for till the year of release. See, we see the order much like it was supposed to be in Israel when Israel wasn't keeping the commandments. But then verse 18 tells us again, the prince shall not take from the people's inheritance. Uh, depriving them. He shall give to his sons from his own inheritance, so my people won't be scattered anymore. So obviously this isn't the Lord. The Lord owns it all, but if, if David has been raised up and has an area and gives gifts, it's David doing it, and he's giving gifts to the Lord. He's honoring to the Lord. So I believe we see a prince that's showing respect to the Lord. And I, I believe that this prince is also at other places called the King David, as we have seen in the scripture. Um, because of the time, let me wind it up right here. And what we'll do next week, which won't take that long, is we'll look at that millennial temple that we've talked about. We'll just look at it in general to get its size um, and what its purpose is for. We're going to see just prior to seeing that land that makes up the temple, that the land of Israel is divided among the 12 tribes. Then we're going to see that a portion is given to this temple. We'll talk about that. And again, why is there a temple then? Why is there a need then? But um, I think I've already hit on the major. I'll give you more reason than this. Yeah, and we'll talk about the feasts that are kept. Then we'll be done with the millennium. But let me take you just in, in finality. Go with me real quickly to 2 Samuel. 2 Shmuel chapter 7. I think we're going to start with about verse 8. 
Um, yeah, I wish I could shut that off. Anyway, now then, verse 8. This is what you shall say to my servant David. This is what the Lord of Army says. I myself took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be leader over my people Israel. Is that David's literal history? Have I lost you? <laughs> David was a shepherd boy when he was called to be king, right? Remember Samuel King. He was led to the house of Jesse. He knew he was to anoint one of the sons to be the king. And so Jesse brings out seven sons. He's got big, brawny sons. Surely one of these is going to be the king. I mean, you want a king that you, wow, look at our king. And the, the one comes before the prophet Samuel, Shmuel, and God says, uh-uh. Next one comes and in, in Samuel's spirit, uh-uh. Finally, they've gotten through all seven. And, and Samuel's, do you have any more sons? Well, Jesse says, yeah, I've got my, the, the, the runt of the group. I've got the lean little guy. I've got the, the he's ready, but he's just a little guy. He, he's out taking care of the sheep. Well, bring him in, <laughs> bring him in. And as soon as he comes in, God says to Shmuel, this is the one. He is the one who will become king over Israel. This was God's choice for the people. So yes, this is the little servant that was keeping the sheep who would be the leader over the people of Israel. Okay? Now, let me take you, because of time, let me take you down to verse 16. Okay? He's talking to David. Um, let me take you to 13, okay? He shall build a house for my name. And we know David set everything up. Solomon actually built it because David had hands of war, bloody hands. So God didn't let him build it, but he prepared the whole thing. He made the plans. He got all the materials together. All someone had to do was put it together. So David's given the credit for it. He shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, if he's going to establish David's kingdom forever, doesn't it make sense that David sits as king? Of course, again, under the king of kings. But why is he called king of kings if there aren't other kings? So it fits. It fits perfectly. God tells how he'll be a father to him, how his favor will be on him. Then verse 16, your house, speaking to David, your house, your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Ever. So he said it to the prophet Shmuel. We read it in other prophecies. We see it all the way in Revelation also. I fully believe God will raise up David, raise up the tabernacle of David, like he said, and sit David on a, a throne under his rule, but in Israel, in Jerusalem, and David will rule forever. I, I, I believe in it very literally. You're free to take it symbolically if that's your take, but I take it literally. I don't have any problem with it because he's not usurping. This one acts as a prince giving gifts to the king of kings, but he also holds an earthly title of kingship because God promised it forever. Why is that important? God made us promises forever. If he made us promises forever and he stopped short on David's, then he can stop short on ours, and that would worry me. But what God said, he does. And he never pulls back, and he never changes his mind, and he never has a problem accomplishing his plan. So, on the power that we see, why the millennial kingdom is so important. If God promised a millennial reign, if God promised Israel to receive these earthly blessings, and then he decides, well, I'm not going to do it because she didn't do right, then God's changed his mind, and God's pulled back on his promise, but God said, I'm making the promise unconditional. Even if you don't do your part, I will do my part. Now, he has to bring them through to a point that they can receive it. He has to child train them. He has to get them right and ready to receive it, but he keeps his word. Our God is a faithful God. Our God keeps his promises. Our God promised us salvation forever. That means I don't worry about it ending one day. That means, as I said, and somebody brought it back to my mind the other day, take it to the bank. He gave you a check, cash it. Take it to the bank. It is yours. What he has promised you, he will do. 
That's why it's important for me to see his promise in his timeline also. He's faithful to it. He's faithful to us. Do we see ourselves walking through the timeline? Absolutely. Do we see the edge of the tribulation? You'd have to put blinders on not to see it. There are so many scriptures that are so much more alive today than 50 years ago because of technology that fits into what Revelation said. So many other ways. You look at scripture scientifically. You look at it historically. You look at it from archaeology. You look at it from any walk of life and it proves itself true. That's the amazing word of God that we have. It goes beyond man. That is a God who is able, no matter what man does, to keep his perfect plan moving forward. And that's what we see that he's doing. Satan still thinks he can come against him, throw his plan out, set himself up as God, and draw all the worship to himself, which is what he wants. He wants to be worshipped like God. That God has that final word, and he will not succeed, and he will be done away with. And when we get done with the millennial uh, temple that we'll start with next time, showing you the divisions for the tribes in the millennial temple, then we will look at Satan's last attempt to come up against God and ruin his plan, and we'll find out what happens in the end. And I read the final chapter. I know who wins. <laughs> so no one worry through the week. It has the right ending, the good ending. Our king wins. That means we win. We're on the winning team. If you're not on the winning team, plug into the Lord and get on the winning team because you want to win in the end too. So may that fill your heart with joy. May that encourage you. May that strengthen you through this week. And when you think your problems are so big and bad, think about all God has to do over the entire world for his purposes to come out. And he's never been stopped yet. He promises a perfect time when Messiah would come. He gives 300 plus prophecies and Messiah comes in that perfect timing. Gets born exactly where it said he would be born, even though his family is not living where he's got to be born and she's nine months pregnant. But God gets him there. Everything happened exactly. Give me one prophecy not fulfilled of Messiah and I'll tell you, I'll throw the whole Bible out because if one word fails, I can't trust the rest of it either. Then it could be full of error somewhere else too. That God proves it every which way. My dad used to say, I'll give you $10,000 if you can prove the Bible wrong. And he'd say that safely, not because he had $10,000 sitting in the bank to give, but because he knew no one can come against the scripture and prove it wrong. It proves itself right every time. That's why the rapture is the next step. That's right. Because everything's right. been fulfilled. That's right. And we're just on edge waiting so for I'm, that. I'm so excited. You know. Be excited. <laughs> Good. Be excited. And you know what? Even with your ears that are hard to hear, you're going to hear that shofar blow. You're going to hear that shout that says, oh, come up. <laughs> and you're going to go. And you're going to go. With my hearing aids off. <laughs> you what? With my hearing aids off. With your hearing off. aids off. <laughs> I probably still hear it. Rowena's got the thumbs up too, yes. Yeah, you will hear it, I guarantee you. We will all, those of us who belong to him, will hear and will go. As, as Patsy Claremont says, and I love her humor, he toots and I scoot. <laughs> so, hallelujah. We've got a great God. I don't know that I can ever manage to end class at 3.30. It's 3.45 again. I'm, I'm sorry, Rhonda, your dog probably has needed to go out long before now. In fact, that she may be gone. She may have had to take her dog. But anyway, um, we're ending on a great note because we're ending on that note of victory. Be encouraged. Be strengthened. Our God is a faithful God. And when he promises to meet your every need, he meets your every need. When he promises he won't forsake you, he doesn't forsake you. When he promises that, that he won't abandon, that he'll work things together for good, he does it. He is an awesome, he is an amazing, he is our ineffable God. And it is forever. Get excited. I love the excitement of Pam. She's raring to go. <laughs> so, um, Let's close in a word of prayer, then we'll open it up. And I see wants to make a comment. Is it okay to pray first? Okay. As soon as prayer is over, unmute yourself and you get the first comment, okay? 
Lord God, we shout hallelujah and praise to your holy name. You are El Gabor, almighty God, and you are worthy of our praise. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the one who will raise up David and sit him on the throne, but you are on the higher throne, and you are high and lifted up even now. And we thank you that you, in your majesty and in your keeping of the whole world, at the same moment in time, have your eyes turned toward us. Are our personal God, our personal helper, our personal salvation. We are like David saying, when we need help, we look up to the mountains, the maker of the mountains who made heaven and earth. What is impossible with you? Nothing. Thank you, God. Thank you that you are in a relationship with us. You can pour into us all the strength, the wisdom, the help that we need. Lord, let us hear your voice. Be turned, tuned in to you that we might do, even in these last moments here on earth, what you would have us to do, that we could bring glory to you. We praise you. What a magnanimous plan. Who could have thunk but a, our great God? And we praise you. And we rejoice in what you have planned for us for all of eternity. And we say, hallelujah, amen, and amen. amen.